Hello, thanks for joining us. My name is Tamo Nakahara. I run the developer experience team here at a company called WeWorks. Hopefully you're here to join us uh, because you're interested in our topic today, which is on Amazon's EKS uh, and EKS Cuddle, which is an open source project uh, that we created here at WeWorks. So hopefully you're here for the right reason. Uh, this is called the Weave Online User Group, which we run on Tuesdays this season uh, at 10 a.m. Pacific time. So we're pretty much here every week, uh, sometimes with guest speakers, sometimes with our own, with a variety of topics, usually in the Kubernetes space. So if this is your first time, welcome, it's good to see you. So today uh, we're very fortunate to have Michael Hostenblas from the AWS team. Uh, and Ily Dmitrichenko, who is on our team in uh, WeWorks. He's in the engineering team and the creator of EKS Cuddle. So hopefully you're here because uh, either you're looking to get started with EKS, uh, and maybe you have questions about that, um, and maybe you've heard about EKS Cuddle, which is the official uh, CLI now for EKS. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, any questions you have, please, this is the perfect place um, with, this, uh, with these speakers, Michael and Ilya. So any questions you have, we'd be happy to help. Also, EKS Cuddle is open source, so we'll be um, sharing some information around that, some internals. So if anybody wants to contribute, we are very welcome for anybody who's willing to do that. So thanks for joining us, and hopefully you're here for that to get your information on that. Um, I'll also give a heads up though that, that um, so Michael, um, based on certain kind of uh, rules with AWS, officially cannot answer questions within this forum, um, but Ilya will do his best. And um, of course, we'll share the Slack channel where there he is officially able to answer questions there. So it's a little bit uh, strange, but um, hopefully a lot of what they talk about will cover what you're looking to find. So a little bit of an intro here. So thanks for your patience in advance. So as I mentioned, this is called the Weave Online User Group, and it's brought to you by our company called WeaveWorks. Uh, we are a startup based in London, San Francisco, New York, Berlin, with distributed teams. Uh, a little bit of our background is um, that if you've heard of RabbitMQ, our founders, our CEO and CTO, and some of our engineer and staff uh, come from that world. They created RabbitMQ, sold, built a company, and sold it to VMware, and then now noticed um, that there are uh, needs within the container and especially Kubernetes space. Uh, so we've been working in that space and have products and open source projects there. Uh, and as part of that, uh, we are uh, VC funded by Excel Partners, as well as a few, few others, uh, one of which is Google Ventures, which I mentioned because of that importance of our um, deep uh, ex expertise and embeddedness within the Kubernetes communities. So a lot of our background is based in open source. Uh, some of you might have heard of WeaveNet, which was the first uh, project that we put out there to, that still is sort of one of the premier um, solutions if you want to network your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, others that you might know us for are, might be Cortex, which we've uh, built out and is now in the CNCF. And it, is, um, it extends and makes uh, Prometheus more scalable and improves it in other ways. Uh, Flux, uh, which has just joined the CNCF as a sandbox project, does automated deployments and was really the foundation of, for the term that you might have heard of now called GitOps, which we put out there based on what we observed out in the wild and what we were doing ourselves using Flux. Um, and Weave Scope, which is, um, observe, provides observability and gives real-time um, visualization for your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, we've got plenty more, um, but one of our most popular ones recently is Weave Flagger, which is also built by someone in our developer experience team at WeaveWorks, uh, and that provides um, automated progressive delivery if you're using Kubernetes, and especially if you're using uh, service meshes. So we've got plenty more, but if you're interested, um, check out our GitHub pages, which we'll share later, as well as our um, web page. Uh, of course, we also have commercial project products. Um, our main one that we've had for a while is called Weave Cloud. Um, it is a SaaS product that helps you manage your Kubernetes clusters, do automated deployments, as well as get metrics. So it's some of the components that I mentioned hosted and supported and inter, um, intertwined in a way that helps you maximize your use of all of those in, um, in a paid product. Um, so because of that, we've been running that on Kubernetes on AWS. So we actually have now at this point, four years of running Kubernetes in production. So um, our team um, contributes and does upstream code to the Kubernetes community. We have actual user experience of 
running it in production. Um, and so our new product that we're putting out this year is called Weave Kubernetes Platform, which is actually some of uh, built upon the original um, sort of Kubernetes distribution that we built to build Weave Cloud. And now we're in the process of productizing that. And since we've been deeply involved in sort of pushing and creating this GitOps methodology, we are building a platform that is very GitOps aware. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you can reach out to us for that. And since we've been running Kubernetes in production for now four years, of course, we have a lot of knowledge that we put out there in the form of consulting, training and support, because um, a lot of people end up needing that as they're on different parts of their Kubernetes journey. So thanks for listening. If you're interested in any of these, please reach out to us and we'd be happy to follow up with you. And hopefully that helps sort of give some of the background of what we've been doing. So our website, if you've never seen it before, is weave.works. Uh, and like I said, you'll find information on both our open source and paid uh, products there. So this is our Weave online user group. And today, as I mentioned, hopefully you're here because you're interested in learning about EKS uh, and or EKS Cuddle, uh, both to use it or potentially to contribute to EKS Cuddle. So hopefully we have the, obviously the right people here. Michael uh, from AWS and Ilya from uh, Weaveworks are the right people to ask all these questions. So please uh, be active and um, ask anything that you'd like. Um, so on that note, uh, these usually run about 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, it can be as short as 30 minutes, depending on what we cover, your, what, how many questions there are, and usually average though about 45. If people are burning and have tons of stuff that they want to discuss and have questions, we can go over time, but we do an absolute hard stop at 60 minutes. So we have one hour, um, but usually close around 45. To ask your questions, uh, we're using a platform called Zoom, so please ask your questions in the chat box. Uh, hopefully you can see the button. Sometimes hitting escape gets you out of full screen mode and makes it easier to find the various buttons and such for chat. Uh, a right reminder, when you do ask or sometimes answer questions, please make sure that you are chatting to um, everyone or sometimes it might say to all panelists and attendees. So please make sure you do that so that everybody can see your questions, unless you have something that's burningly private that you just want to ask to us. But otherwise, please make sure you choose that now in your um, drop down for your chat so you're ready to go when you have questions to ask. So with that, I will hand it over to Michael and Ilya. Please let me know if I need to stop sharing my slides or whether you can take over. So I'm going to share my slides and Michael will begin presenting. Thank you. Hey there. Hello. So you said you are going to get excellent. Thanks. Okay. Can everybody see this now? Yep. Cool. Michael, please go ahead. All right. So I'm super excited about the, the opportunity today joining you folks here doing that webinar here with Ilya, uh, who I really admire for doing uh, the great job putting together EKS Cuddle and leading it where it is now. And um, I thought, well, before we start and, and jump into the deep end with EKS Cuddle, I'm going to talk a little bit about EKS. And if you're familiar with it, you might not uh, be aware of how we approach things. If you're not familiar, this little section at the beginning here should give you a bit of an idea how we go about things. So EKS, or formerly the Elastic Kubernetes Service, is a platform uh, when we are focusing on production grade workloads. So really the security aspect, reliability are really our main focus. That means that if you decide to run your prod environment on EKS, we uh, have an SLA, SLO around that and we'll do our utmost to provide you with a reliable environment. We also, from day one, focused on a native upstream Kubernetes experience. So we're not forking anything, we're taking the vanilla upstream Kubernetes version as it is and um, making sure that, yeah, we're applying security patches, obviously, uh, also for older uh, versions as soon as we can um, and making sure that you have the most uh, unforked experience that is possible. 
being AWS, we have a few services that you might be using along with, with Kubernetes, things like S3 or Dynamo or whatever. And we aim to provide these integrations as uh, seamless as possible. Uh, one approach how to go about that you might uh, have heard about the AWS service operator, um, essentially making that available through a uh, single place in, in a, a custom controller and CRDs. And myself and, and many, many others, engineering and others are contributing upstream in six other CNCF activities um, that you know, includes technical, but also community level. Um, and we aim to collect and communicate the good practices um, throughout. And many of us have been around in the communities, uh, community for quite a while, been starting with that around 2015. And I'm super excited to see how successful and how uh, interesting things are, are getting around here. Uh, next slide, please. So we started out with GA uh, in, in uh, a bit more than a year ago, I remember that. And um, we provided a number of things uh, along the way uh, most of that is more or less based on asks we got from the community. Uh, over the year, a number of things, uh, stuff like um, support for GPU enabled EC2 instances, um, the horizontal pad autoscaler with custom metrics. Uh, later on in 2018, we uh, added support for the dynamic admission controllers and LB support for the Ingress controller. Uh, more and more regions. Uh, the most recent one, which I think is not yet on the slide, is Bahrain uh, from last week. Um, we then started uh, to be a bit more strict with the upstream, uh, following the upstream um, versions. So end of 2018, we came up with 1.11 support. Um, next slide, please. And in the 2019 slide, you already then see that we then formalized this deprecation policy, defining exactly how we go about, how long we support, how many versions of Kubernetes. Uh, more launches in different regions. Um, here I mentioned already, hang on, <laughs> but, um, I mentioned already the SLA uh, around there. Um, we provided things like control plane logs um, for, for other things. We have better access to anything that is going on uh, and you can use it for editing purposes in, in the control plane. Um, with deep learning benchmark utility uh, support there. Um, and if you look closely at that list, you will probably see a little Easter egg. I'm not gonna go into great detail right now, but something that we're launching very, very soon. All right, now we are ready for the next slide. And that is the public roadmap. We've, uh, I'm pretty sure, in the first cloud provider, at least uh, I'm 100% sure that we're the first service team within AWS that actually has a public roadmap. And this public roadmap, I cannot underline and highlight how important that is, uh, both for us and for you. So if you go to that link here on GitHub AWS organization and containers roadmap, you will see uh, all the different issues from uh, something that is proposed, uh, we uh, flag when we're working on it actively, uh, coming soon, meaning will be launched in the next couple of weeks or so, and then the delivered ones. And this is the best way for you to tell us what you like to see. Uh, and the more specific you are, uh, focusing on either the use case and defining what kind of issues you have or uh, reporting on certain experiences, you, you know, limitations you see the easier it is, the better it is for us to then uh, take that and turn that into concrete uh, work in, in our service team. All right, so uh, that was the high level of, of where EKS comes from and, and what we're doing overall. And you might not know or might not realize it in the first place, but EKS at the current point in time really is a uh, managed control plane, right? So we have uh, a HA control plane that has an API server, and etcd and uh, controller manager and scheduler in there for you. But if you want to put some workload on it, then at a certain point in time, you need a data plane. So how do you go about the data plane? Uh, initially, 
And we essentially said, yeah, whatever customers want to use, Terraform, CloudFormation, uh, your favorite shell script. But it turns out that users really want a standardized and uh, reliable way uh, to, to provision the, the data plane to provision um, an EKS cluster as a, as a whole unit that both the control plane and data plane uh, comes up and that also the, the entire lifecycle in terms of migration uh, is covered. At that point in time, um, we found that uh, there is an awesome community project led by WeaveWorks and um, we essentially uh, said, well, given that this is what, what the community uh, wants and, and uh, is working on, why don't we uh, just you know, join forces and trying to work together with WeaveWorks um, to make EKS Cuddle the, the actual standard CLI for EKS. And yeah, Ilya and myself, we know each other already for a couple of years. I can't remember when, when we first met, but I think it was somewhere in Amsterdam in 2015 or so. Um, and I was super happy when I saw that uh, it was actually Ilya's uh, baby. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I'm super happy that we are we're again getting the opportunity to work together here. And with that, I think I'm handing over to you, Ilya, right? Thanks, Michael. Um... Let me just go back to Zoom and turn on my camera. Um, okay, so um, yeah, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is EKS at all, um, and uh, then discuss some of the features that, that we've built um, so far, and uh, what are we looking to build in the coming months and potentially years. Um, so what is EKS control? Uh, it is an open source project by Works in collaboration with AWS. Uh, we make minor release every week with occasional patch releases. So it's been a pretty, uh, pretty actively worked on project. And um, yeah, we've been working on it since, uh, since over a year now. Uh, and the first, uh, first alpha release was, was out in June, 2018, uh, with the uh, first um, uh, minor release out in, in August. 2018. In July 2019, we've released the last of uh, 0.1 series, um, 0.140, followed up with uh, 0.2 shortly after that. And uh, now, now that we are making minor releases every couple of weeks, we are at 0.43 and uh, coming next week. Well, actually, actually this week um, is 0.5. The primary focus is on developer experience, uh, and we have a, a rather fast growing community of uh, EKS control users and contributors. Um, the, the main view that EKS control takes is that uh, we provide a cluster centric approach to managing your clusters and not a resource oriented one. Um, if you're familiar with tools like Terraform and um, CloudFormation, um, those, those are the uh, resource-oriented tools where you basically collect a number of resources that you know, have certain dependencies and uh, reference one another uh, and uh, overall result in something like a Kubernetes cluster um, being created. But nevertheless, when you're looking at a Terraform module, um, it is just a collection of resources um, like, you know, security groups, uh, subnets, EC2 instances, auto scaling groups, other, other similar kind of resources that you'll find in AWS. Um, and the cloud formation is very much the same in that respect. It also lets you manage resources, you know, somewhat more high level than, than just using AWS CLI, for instance, but still you manage resources nevertheless. So something like a cluster upgrade operation involves multiple steps, multiple different changes to different resources. With EKS control, all those operations, such as cluster upgrade, cluster scaling, are cluster centric and defined in a way that makes sense within the context of a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and you can always drill into the individual resources and you can manage your resources yourself, like you can manage the BBC separately with CloudFormation or Terraform or whatever that you prefer to use. Uh, 
or whatever it is that you are required to use and import those into your key as control. But to begin with, we give you everything, everything that is enough to run a cluster and you'd manage all of those resources in a cluster-centric approach without having to think about individual resources during something like an upgrade operation or scale-up, scale-down operation. So current, um, current use cases, the, the, the kind of just standard use cases that the DKS control caters for are things like uh, creating a cluster in one step, creating a cluster with an existing VPC, as I mentioned, just now, or um, you know, managing multiple non-groups in different uh, with different configurations in the same cluster. Uh, you could uh, you could have node groups with different EC2 tags. Uh, you can use uh, spot instances in some node groups and uh, no spot instances in some other node groups. So you can have different style of spot instance configurations uh, as well. You can have private and public subnets, or um, you know you could use Amazon Linux or um, Ubuntu or uh, potentially a custom AMI, and you can even set a custom bootstrap script. Uh, and you could set instance roles and uh, provide extra security groups, um, et cetera. There are quite a few features that we provide at node group level, and uh, we allow you to manage as many node groups as you could possibly um, care to run in your cluster, right? A node group is, a, uh, is, is an ASG with, uh, with a few attributes attached to it a uh, slightly more high level uh, abstraction on top of ASG that, that is cluster centric. Um, and you can customize uh, your cluster configuration using YAML or JSON API. That is another main use case, which we will talk more about, which encompasses what I would just mentioned around mod groups. And so here's, here's an example, sorry. Uh, so he, here's here's the basic CLI usage: create a cluster, uh, add add extra node group, scale a node group, delete the node group, write kube config to to a file uh, if you happen to lose it, or if you happen to create a new cluster from one machine and then need the kube config on another machine. Uh, you can describe cluster stack details. You could look into who created a particular cluster uh, through cloud cloud trail events, and um, you can dig into <clears throat> underlying cloud formation templates as well, if you'd like. Um, and um, you can upgrade a cluster and uh, add a node group with spot instances, for example. So here's, here's an example of, uh, those are all the things that you can, can do with, uh, with the CLI. Uh, if, you, if you'd like to get more advanced, uh, you, you, you probably want to use the config file. And here is a here here's here's one example of a very simple config file and, and a slightly more sophisticated config file um, on the the right hand side. So on the left hand side we have a um, an example one a. It is a cluster in US West three, EU West three, excuse me, and um, it has one node group ng one, and it uses instance type m m five large with desired capacity ten. Uh, while uh, the one on the the right hand side. Uh, uses a larger instance and uh, it, it sets minimum size and maximum size and you might want to configure auto scaling for that for that node group and it uses private networking as well. So just uh, just a few very simple examples of config files here. Um, a more advanced example with um, a couple of uh, additional things for uh, here we show how, how you can import existing subnets uh, for, for a VPC uh, to a cluster you create with EKS control. So let's say, you know, somebody in your team created the VPC and the, you're required to use that VPC. So you're going to import just the subnets that, that you are required to use. Uh, and in this case, you'll be looking to use just private subnets. And if you, if you opt in to do that, we will not manage the public subnets for you. You would have to import those also or, or let us manage everything. Um, so once you dive into to, into to this kind of level, uh, you know you 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 opt out from from functionality that the KS control provides around managing subnets and providing a a um, highly available NAT gateway configuration or anything like that. But but you get the advantage of using existing resources, um, and uh, you could specify IAM roles as well. So if you don't have permissions to create IAM roles, you can use existing ones. Um, that someone else created for you. 
Um, so here, here's another example of a node group where we also touch uh, additional security groups and the uh, IAM prof profile ARN and a role ARN. So we don't need to, we don't need to have permissions to manage uh, those IAM resources. And we, we use some security group that, that, uh, that's been created for us. Okay. So uh, still um, just, uh, just a slightly more advanced example with existing VPC and existing IAM resources. Um, yeah. So I have another example here, uh, which uh, showcases uh, two node groups in one cluster. And uh, we, can, we can see that there are a number of additional fields available. You could provide um, Kubernetes labels that would be set on that node group and taints. You could also provide EC2 tags if you'd like to set separate EC2 tags specific uh, to, to your node groups. Uh, sometimes that, that, that is required. Uh, we would normally set a tag based on the node group name, but if you, if you want to set any custom tags, you can do that too, um, along with the labels and taints. Uh, you, you, you can see private networking being used here again. A very large in instance. And actually, um, there's a pre bootstrap command, and we're also using a single availability zone for this particular node group. In some of the use cases, people people asked for for ability to do that. Uh, you you might want to create a um, single availability zone um, node group uh, when you want to run some some compute heavy um, uh, compute compute and networking heavy. Um, uh, workloads uh, which uh, you know cannot tolerate the latency that you get between uh, availability zones potentially. Uh, so if you if you want to to run a bunch of nodes close to one another in the same availability zone, you can do that by specifying just a single availability zone, like like shown here. And uh, it shows a this example also shows a pre-bootstrap command being used, and there is some shell script that 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 you can call out to right. Um, and uh, you could specify a, a series of pre bootstrap commands and do any customizations that way if you really have to run some commands before kubelet starts up. Uh, and the second uh, example, node group ng1, uh, is, um, is somewhat, um, somewhat like one we saw earlier, but it also has a uh, volume size um, larger than the default. Uh, it sets uh, 100 gigabyte volume size and it uses volume type GP2, um, which I think is a default, but you could, you could imagine that you would set that to, to IL1 or something like that if you'd like. Um, and then it also has uh, some labels. And, and then the, there is an IAM role associated with it as well. Uh, it has, um, it has autoscaler IAM role enabled and uh, uh, the, and, and that's why we, we are setting min size and max size here because we are going to use um, node or cluster autoscaler here. Okay, so um, so the, these are three examples of different config files. You can find more on the um, ekscontrol.io uh, in our docs. And um, uh, yeah, uh, please visit the, the website for more documentation. So a little bit about the roadmap. Uh, going forward, we, we're looking to, to work towards uh, these uh, three main themes. Uh, there may be others that will emerge, but at the moment, this, this is what we're looking at. Um, one of them is GitOps Quick Start. That is something that, that we've been um, introducing into EKS Control uh, in the last few releases. Uh, there's an experimental feature that allows you to uh, install Flux and optionally Tiller and uh, a, um, a profile of uh, workloads that, that get uh, populated um, through, through GitOps, uh, essentially enabled by Flux, uh, which is, by the way, a VWorks project that, that's been recently donated to CNCF and is now a, a CNCF sandbox project. So uh, yeah, GitOps Quick Start is, is one area. Another area is declarative cluster configuration. So essentially, we're looking to implement EKS control apply and also provide support for cluster API. And you'd be able to, to say EKS control apply, given a config, implement that 
make some changes to the config, run the KS control apply again, um, and see those changes being implemented in the cluster. So anything like upgrades, scale down, scale up, any other changes to the cluster uh, will be possible with the KS control apply. We're not there yet, but that's where we're heading. And cluster API is an upstream effort that standardizes uh, this kind of cluster management through a common API that we'd like to implement. Um, at the moment, EKS control config is inspired by cluster API, but it's not a one-to-one -one match. Um, it is somewhat more high level though than cluster APIs itself. Cluster add-ons, it relates to, to, to the GitOps um, theme, but it is somewhat separate. There is a SIG cluster lifecycle add-on spec that is being worked on that some of our team members are contributing towards. And uh, we're looking to, to, to adopt that in the case control as well. Um, cool. so Actually, I'm, yeah. Are you okay if I ask a quick question there on the roadmap? Um, just in case, um, if you haven't heard of the term GitOps, uh, and even if you haven't, maybe you can guess what it is a little bit. But could you explain a little bit? Um, uh, just you can even give the one sentence understanding about GitOps. And I, I'm kind of curious about the quick start. Is that like a toolkit to get started? And do you have a little bit more information on that? Yeah. So essentially, you know, right now you can create a cluster. And, uh, and then, you know, it's up to you how you manage your workloads uh, in that cluster, right? Uh, at WeWorks, we've been pioneering the, the, the um, uh, GitOps methodology, which essentially is all about making sure that every change to your cluster goes through a Git repository. Uh, you check in every, um, every workload you want to run and every, uh, every bit of configuration, and in some cases, even encrypted secrets. Uh, We've, we've seen that being done as well. And in some cases, if you use something like um, um, AWS service operator, you, you could check in um, any, any, any kind of objects that, that let you manage something like uh, you know, DynamoDB or S3. So you could, you could define your um, database tables in, in your uh, configuration repository. And uh, Flux is, uh, is the CNCF sandbox project that we recently donated that enables you to synchronize a cluster to, to a Git repo. It could be used with Helm Tiller and uh, it, could be used to, it can be used to, to, to manage multiple clusters or um, you know, do, do a whole range of different things. You can find out more about um, Flux by, um, uh, by going to the the Flux repository on GitHub. Um, Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. So um, yeah, Flux is an implementation of a GitOps operator. There are there are other solutions which are similar to it, um, and uh, we we provide in in EKS control we provide a way to to install Flux into your cluster easily with uh, an option to install Tiller as well, and then we we have a way for you to to populate that. Um, repository that you connect to your cluster with, uh, with a few workloads, such as LB ingress controller and, um, and cluster autoscaler and a few other things. Do you want to take the question now or do you want to wait to the end? We've got one um, question. I, I, guess, uh, I guess I could take a question now. Okay. Um, we can, short... Yeah, let's say if it's going to take a longer discussion, we can, we can big mark it. But, um, we're asking here, are we talking about using Flux to sync the config state or state of the Kubernetes cluster deployed to EKS as opposed to using Flux to sync the config slash state of a Kubernetes deployment? Uh, so we are talking about both of those things on this slide. So in the, in the, first, um, in the first case, GitHub's quick start, that would be about deployments and, uh, and any config maps or uh, what have you and um, you know, just general workload related use. And in the case of cluster API, uh, we'd be looking to, to actually manage uh, cluster configuration as well. That's a good question. Um, and actually, if you don't mind, as part of that, I'm curious, so the GitOps quit start. So you say it's on a roadmap. Um, before this comes out, there's still some sort of GitOps qualities that you have as part of the KS couple, is that? Yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, I'm generally talking about, you know, the, the themes of features that we're working on. 
and uh, some of the uh, some of the GitOps features have landed as experimental into EKS control in the recent releases, as I mentioned earlier. So uh, if you if you download the latest release of EKS control and go to our, to the website, you'll find um, you'll find information there uh, how how to try it out. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So Michael, you had another slide. Right. So um, this pretty much uh, builds upon the, the story that uh, Ilya has, has been telling in the last uh, couple of minutes. And it's really about how we view uh, EKS uh, as a whole. So obviously, if you're provisioning a cluster and it's, it's you know, uh, there is not much there than, than control plane and, and a few worker nodes, uh, you're not doing a lot with that. There are a number of repetitive tasks, be it around instrumentation, be it, um, being able to, to do application lifecycle management, et cetera, uh, that we'd like to see um, being part of this provisioning uh, or provisioning process. And for us, this combination of open source and open APIs uh, is really crucial. We really believe that um, with a vibrant and strong co community overall, and we being uh, one of the, the contributors and members of that, um, it, it, everyone benefits, right? It's a win-win situation. And as you can see on that slide, um, some of those things are already um, part of the offering. For example, we're using Envoy in, in AppMesh, in the AppMesh data plane. Um, others, um, such as uh, Prometheus, uh, everything around open telemetry, uh, OPA related stuff is something we, we're working on considering. Uh, FluentBit, we have released that a uh, couple of, of weeks ago, the FluentBit um, uh, block uh, output router. And um, yeah, for us, this is really crucial to make sure that uh, everyone has access to that and um, can benefit from the, the overall ecosystem. Um, I'll see if there are any questions. Otherwise, I'll hand back to Ileana. Okay. Well, so, we um, did have two. Do you, you asked about questions? Do you want to the two questions now? Here, I'll go ahead and put it out there, but you can then decide whether we should bookmark it or not. Because I guess you can't answer questions, but maybe Ilya can. Uh, the first one was just toward the end of when uh, Ilya was finishing presenting. He said, um, I'm not quite sure what this question is, but can I integrate this with the other AWS surface? If yes, please provide some scenarios. Maybe the question is, can I integrate this with other AWS services? Or I don't know what the other AWS services. Uh, sure, you can use, uh, you can use, um, EKS with with any of the other AWS services, you could, you know, uh, run workloads um, and uh, and and have them talk to to any uh, any of the R, uh, like any of the dat databases like RDS or Dynamo, or uh, you could use S3 or anything else. It is it is at the workload uh, level. It's not it's not EKS Control's own concern at that stage. Uh, we we're not concerned about. It. Uh, what other services you use uh, per se. We allow you to define uh, IAM instance uh, roles and, uh, and other things and integrate with all the, the features that EKS exposes directly. Um, but there isn't, you know, there, there isn't anything in particular that, that, that would stop you from using any, um, any other AWS services. Okay. Um, and then we have another question, I guess, more broadly about EKS. Is it possible to use EKS to provision even the front end, um, like API Gateway, CloudFront, NLB to Ingress, Ingress Controller Installation, Istio, et cetera? That's right. So it's a very interesting question. I did mention um, AWS Service Operator briefly earlier, uh, and, uh, and that's essentially what you'd be looking to use. AWS Service Operator maps um, uh, AWS resources uh, to to Kubernetes objects, so you can, for example, define a Dynamo table uh, as a Kubernetes object, and um, and you know create that in your cluster, and uh, have that Dynamo table come up um, shortly afterwards, and uh, reference that in, in your application and make use of it. 
uh, or uh, or anything anything else. I'm not entirely uh, up to date on what are all the services that service operators support. Um, perhaps we can discuss that on Slack if you're interested. But just look up AWS service operator and uh, and have a look what what it can do. I've not used it myself to be to be very honest with you, but I know of its capabilities in general terms. Uh, yeah. But essentially, it's meant to allow to to do exactly what you ask. Excellent. Yeah, we got the um, link there in the chat. Um, Excellent. What do you guys have next? That's it for the questions. Oh, no, there is another question. <laughs> um, and again, decide whether you want to cover this now or later. Um, is there any example code where we can use the GitOps um, I guess toolkit or um, GitOps using Flux and EKS Cuddle to create an EKS cluster. Um, I guess the question is, can you use Flux and EKS Cuddle together to create an EKS cluster? So, so that would fall into to one of the roadmap items that that I've alluded to earlier. Uh, we, yeah, we don't currently support that, uh, but we'd be looking to. Uh, to support that in the near, near future. Cool. Uh, reminder to everybody when you post your questions, please um, paste it, uh, post it to everyone. I'm just sitting here copying and pasting. Um, using EKS Cuddle, can we upgrade e um, ETCD or uh, Kubernetes version automatically? Also, how can, um, sorry, also how are backups restored on a failover? So. Can you upgrade etcd? So etcd is uh, is managed by uh, AWS, so you don't need to worry about upgrading it. Uh, and anything to do with etcd, so if, if you're thinking about backups for etcd, that is something that AWS will take care of for you, so you don't need to worry about it. Just like AWS takes care of, of running DynamoDB, uh, ECS, as a matter of fact, and, uh, and uh, any, other, any other services that AWS offers, like RDS or CloudFormation or anything like this, you don't need to worry about. Um, on so does that, okay, that, make, that make sense. Does your answer also cover the second part of the question about backups? Um, are they restored on failover? Is that something that's mm -hmm. also... So that would be implementation detail of how uh, EKS handles that failover. I can't really speak to that. Uh, okay. but, uh, I, I would expect uh, appropriate measures are taken. Okay. Um, and does EKS Cuddle support anything besides AWS VPC CNI? Uh, not directly at the moment. We have, uh, we have that as one of the roadmap items. If you're interested in any particular CNI implementation, uh, please do mention that in an issue. I did. I did see that uh, Cilium uh, folks have published uh, a, um, a published documentation that uses EKS control to to deploy deploy their CNI on EKS. So um, it has definitely it's definitely been achieved, and we've definitely shown how to do that for VNet. We haven't had um, too many users requesting this. Uh, if there is enough interest, we can definitely put more time into into making uh, the user experience a little better. At the moment, it requires some manual steps if you want to, to disable okay. AWS SVPC CNI. And does AWS's version of etcd provide encryption? I cannot really speak to that. Okay, let's move on. Uh, it's um, probably something you can uh, find out about in the documentation or raise an issue on the roadmap, I suppose, and okay. uh, hear back from the AWS folks on this. Okay. And does uh, EKS support multi-master configuration? That's right. It, it actually is multi-master by, by default with a load balancer in front of it. So you don't need to worry about that part. It's, yeah, okay. it's multi-master okay by default. Okay. And does EKS account for blue-green deployments? For example, if you want to do up, rolling upgrades with no downtime, I guess the question is, does it support, does it provide that as part of EKS? Um, so that, well, if you, if you, I suppose you are asking about node upgrades and not uh, Kubernetes workload upgrades because that is that is up to you how you implement that. But you normally have a zero downtime deployment. Uh, 
uh, rollout. But if, you, if you're considering nodes, then this is part of EKS control actually, and the EKS control definitely allows you to, to create a new inaugural and only delete the, the old one once, uh, what, when, once the, the new one is up. So um, we treat no groups immutably, and uh, you'd be basically looking to create a new node group, i.e. a new autoscaling group, and then um, uh, drain all node groups and then delete them. So essentially you make sure that the pods are, are up and running in a new node group, and, uh, and then um, evict it from, from the old one, and, uh, and then you can delete the old one. Cool. Um, I have a question about Slack channels. Uh, we have Stacy here as our community manager as well. Stacy, if you could help me paste the chat to EKS Cuddle in the Slack. And then, Michael, you have your own uh, EKS Slack channel. If you could paste that in the chat, then we have a question about that. So um, yeah, there, mm -hmm. uh, there is a channel in Kubernetes Slack. Uh, yeah. I think so, yeah. it's been renamed recently. There's Provider AWS. Is that, is that the most? recent channel, I think. Um, there was an EKS channel that, that people used and that we do we do monitor Kubernetes like for EKS yeah. and EKS control questions. But so, it's probably ideal if you log into VWork Slack and, uh, and find okay. us. So yeah, so my press Stacy and um, yes, thanks. If you could paste this in, that'd be great. Um, down to the bottom. <laughs> we have, uh, so curious, does pre bootstrap commands um, can it also have Ansel, Ansible YAMLs executed as part of the .sh? Also, is there a way to pass an a AMI? Uh, you can definitely pass an AMI. Uh, if you have Ansible on that AMI, you could run Ansible. Um, I don't see why not. Uh, we don't directly provide support for Ansible, but we don't stop you from doing anything you like with respect to uh, the, um, uh, the custom bootstrap commands. Thank you. Okay, I think we're down to the last one. What is the name of the Terraform module that supports EKS? So there is a Terraform module uh, for EKS. Uh, I, I think it's just called uh, EKS module, uh, but we, uh, uh, we don't integrate that with EKS control, uh, at least not at present. All right. Uh, we'll see if we can find that link later. So thanks for all your questions. Uh, yeah, so we're down to the last parts. Uh, I hand it over to you guys. What last bits do you have? Um, I think that that's what most it for me. Uh, there, there's one more slide here, which, uh, uh, which actually details the, the Slack URL and uh, the GitHub repository name and, uh, and uh, our Twitter handles. I'm a developer. And Michael's M House and Buzz. Excellent. Cool. Thanks Thank for joining. You. Thanks for your questions, folks. Yeah. This, uh, this All right. Great. So I'm going to take over if that's okay. And I will share our last slides. Please let me know if you can see this. Back to here. Can you guys see my slide? Yay, yeah. nay. Okay, great. Um, so thanks again for joining us. If you have more questions, um, we will be following up with an email with all those Slack channels, et cetera. So please, yes, um, chat with Ilya, uh, Michael, and the team. Um, as I mentioned, these are mostly on Tuesdays. So next Tuesday, we've got Chris Love. who will be talking about Basel. So please join for that. Then the week after that, I think the marketing team has a joint webinar with Packet. So they'll be talking about uh, the joint stuff that they do there. and. Uh, to find out more, if this is your first time, the best place is to join our meetup group. That's the single source of truth for um, our upcoming calendar. Uh, again, we've got the Slack uh, channel here. This is for us where you'll find around um, information on EKS Cuddle. And um, we'll be following up with an email. Uh, we mentioned GitOps, so if you're interested in our GitOps ebook, uh, we'll have this bit.ly link sent to you and you can follow up if you'd like to do that. Um, so let me check just a little bit. I know our chat is a little bit uh, busy. Oh, thanks everybody for sharing those links. Really appreciate it and many thanks. So thank you again. Thanks for taking the time, Michael and Ilya. Um, and to any of you to our follow-up email, if you are looking for more of these updates um, in the future, please let me know. It's a little bit hard to gauge, especially around EKS Cuddle, like how people want to engage if they would like these kinds of presentations and updates. So um, 
let me know, give me feedback, that's very helpful. And especially if you are interested in contributing potentially to EKS Cuddle, then please reach out to us, reach out to Ilya, and we um, have a growing community of contributors and, and maintainers. So we would love to get more help and get use cases. So that's very helpful. So with that, um, I thank you guys for joining. And if there aren't any other questions, thanks everybody for coming and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ilya. Thanks, Michael. Right now. See you. Bye. Thanks for joining. Bye. Bye.